cries, feels our pain, and heals our wounds. Welcome to Metropolitan Community Church of the Coachella Valley. Welcome! It's so good to see you all here. I'm Deacon Jim, filling in for Reverend, who's gone to, on his way to Chicago and Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and whoever else, wherever else he lands. But, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's gone for a short vacation. Hard working vacation, hard vacation. <laughs> I'd like to welcome anybody who's visiting here for the first time. If you could raise your hands, and we'd like to welcome you. Wonderful. Worship this morning. After service, we have a fellowship hour at the other end of the building, and we have it looked like lunch. <laughs> I think we have a full lunch today, so please join us. <laughs> no, please join us. Please join us. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank everyone who made yesterday Dick's Memorial such a success. Um, these are some of the flowers that the family brought. Um, it was a beautiful service. The family was so blessed. The choir did wonderfully. You know, Ray made lunch, and it was just fabulous. <laughs>
come to God in just a time of honesty and authenticity, where we just open our lives to the Holy Spirit, and we just ask God to bring to mind those things that we need to lay down for His forgiveness. In this time of silence, would you please be bold to approach the throne of God's grace. Joy on the upright in heart. 
heart. Rejoice in God, you who are righteous, and praise God's holy name. Glory be to the Creator, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it ever shall be, the world without end. Amen.
about the Ancient of Days, that he is just, and that he is incredibly powerful. The first truth, God's justice, provides comfort to the downtrodden that wrongs will be righted. And the second truth, the power of God, provides a stern warning to the unjust nations who are about to be judged that they're in for a rough ride. Later in the same reading, we hear about one like a son of man, that is, someone who looks a lot like a human being, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, I can't say that I'm an expert on the clouds of heaven or even the clouds of earth, but I will say that when clouds appear in a biblical story, there's usually something very mysterious going on, something that we can't quite see or understand, but we know something powerful and truthful is there. The clouds on which this one like a son of man arrived are a symbol that point to a greater truth that this figure in Daniel's prophetic vision is unique. He is God's chosen representative, the anointed one, the coming Messiah. In the psalm that we read responsibly, fire and clouds show up again, along with bright light. God is surrounded by clouds and thick darkness. Both the clouds and the thick darkness symbolize and point to the hidden, mysterious nature of God, that God is one who cannot be seen with our eyes. In contrast, the psalmist says that God's power and righteousness are visible to all, and that the light of God makes all things visible. Fire is used to symbolize God's power, and lightning is used to show that nothing is hidden from God. And I think that that means God's judgments are therefore just. He's not working with imperfect information. By doing this, the psalmist simultaneously sounds an alarm for the unrighteous and provides a message of comfort to the righteous, of joy to the upright in heart. In the reading from Luke's Gospel, where three of the disciples witness what has come to be called the Transfiguration of Christ, we once again see references to bright light and to clouds. Jesus' face is transformed before Peter, John, and James. He is still recognizable to the disciples. They know who he is. But something has happened. His face has somehow changed, and his clothing has become bright as a flash of lightning. Matthew's Gospel says, His face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. There's something of the divine going on here. Something pure and powerful is now being attributed to Jesus. Then two other biblical figures appear with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, some say representing the law and the prophets. Whatever their presence signifies, Peter is beside himself with excitement or perhaps fear. And he blurts out that the disciples should build three shelters for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. His suggestion seems silly, I think, partly because Jesus, Moses, and Elijah didn't need any shelter. And also, Moses and Elijah weren't likely to stay very long. In fact, Luke says they were already leaving when Peter started to talk. Matthew says Peter didn't know what to say. Luke says Peter didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> Sometimes Peter, you'll recall, needs a little hand-holding to absorb a lesson. What comes along next in the story is, you guessed it, a cloud. Matthew says it's a bright cloud. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all say the cloud overshadowed the disciples. Literally, the cloud covered them. Then a voice comes out of the cloud, we know who that is, right? Telling the three disciples, in case they had missed it from the transfiguration itself, this is my son, whom I have chosen, listen to him. Bright light, covering cloud, all pointing to the very presence of God, both in the transfigured Jesus and in the voice from the cloud. Just as with scripture, so too are worshiping together, in our worshiping together, we use symbols or symbolic language to point to a deeper truth or a statement of faith that lies beyond the symbol. Consider, for example, the ritual we perform following the offering each Sunday, right here at the altar. If you were raised in one of the many Christian traditions, the ritual was variously called the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass, the Lord's Supper, 
Holy Communion or simply Communion. And not only is the ritual called different things, but its form looks very different across traditions too, with some recognizable common elements and some familiar common words. Growing up in the American Baptist Church, I knew the ritual as either the Lord's Supper or Communion. We had communion on the first Sunday of every month, which seemed often enough. Some traditions do it less frequently, once a quarter, once a year. Some more frequently. MCC offers communion at our principal, principal weekly service on Sunday every week, and by extension, meaning from the reserve sacrament, during our midweek service on Thursday evening. As I was growing up, in terms of the form, as I was growing up, the deacons distributed small cubes of white bread to everyone who was allowed to take communion. You had to be a member of that church, or at least a member of some church, preferably a Baptist church. <laughs> distributed the bread to everyone who was allowed to take communion, and then the deacons went back to the front of the sanctuary and sat down, and we all took the bread and ate at the same moment at the minister's direction, E.T. all of then the deacons distributed a tiny glass, like a small shot glass, although a Baptist wasn't supposed to be familiar with shot glasses. <laughs> a small glass filled with grape juice. The deacons then returned to the front of the sanctuary, and we all drank from our little glasses at the same moment, at the minister's direction, drinking all. <clears throat> and while the bread and the grape juice were being distributed, we had an opportunity to reflect on the meaning of the ritual, on your relationship to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And by consuming first the bread and then the juice all at the same time as everyone else, there was a real sense that we were all part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. When I entered Yale Divinity School, or YDS, the tradition surrounding communion that I found there was very different. There were morning worship services in the chapel, Monday through Friday, on the weekends we were all busy in our churches. And communion took place every Friday morning. The consecration of the elements, now some freshly baked bread and wine, used pretty much the same words that I was familiar with, sometimes amplified with the celebrant's thoughts about what it all means, perhaps tying it to the sermon that he or she had just delivered a few minutes earlier. And the distribution looked very different, too. We all formed a large circle around the altar, sometimes all the way around the chapel, depending on how many people were there. And we passed the bread and the wine to one another around the circle. Not with the words, the body and blood of Jesus, but rather, bread for your journey and wine for your joy. <clears throat> After everyone in the circle had partaken, we joined hands on a prayer of thanksgiving was said. The symbolism in that approach was less about each of us as an individual member of the body of Christ with our own cube of bread and our own little cup of juice, but rather the process emphasized that all of us, students and faculty alike, were members of the YDS faith community, this particular segment of the body of Christ. We were a vibrant community gathered together in a circle and serving one another through the simple act of passing bread and wine. Another variation on communion with which I became very familiar was the Holy Eucharist as observed at St. Thomas Episcopal Church in New Haven, Connecticut, where I sang in the choir. The Eucharist was celebrated as prescribed in the Episcopal Church's 1979 Book of Common Prayer. And given Reverend Clinton's Anglican background and, and thus how we practice communion here, that service at St. Thomas, the Eucharist at St. Thomas, looked very much the same as our communion service today, with one difference. At least back in the 1980s, members of that congregation approached and knelt at an altar rail all the way across the front of the chancel. And then the priest would then serve communion to each person, walking across the chancel from one side to the other, administering communion to each person. He would serve communion to each person, naming them one by one as he worked his way across. I will never forget how powerful it felt to have the priest say my name as he placed the wafer in my outheld hands. Ken, the body of Christ. And he was somehow able to do this with each person all the way down the line, calling each one by name. 
the emphasis created, the faith statement of, asserted, was not that I was a part of the body of Christ or that I was a member of a particular faith community, but rather that I was individually loved, respected, fed, and known by God as represented in his servant and priest. So the symbolism of the Eucharist, Holy Communion, Mass, the Lord's Supper, points us to different but complementary truths, different aspects of faith. It's not about the bread or the wine, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. It's not about that we all eat and drink at the same moment, or line up down the center aisle, or kneel in front of an altar, or indeed receive communion in a hospital bed. It's rather how the symbols, the bread and wine, the words said, the actions performed, and all the rest, how those things point to a reality beyond what we can objectively know, but which we believe. That we are members of a body of Christ that spans two millennia. That we are spiritually fed by Christ at his table. That we are members of a beloved faith community, and that we are indeed loved as individual persons by God. Having talked some about the symbols in scripture and the symbolism of the communion service, I want to move next to how music functions in our worship together in symbolic ways as well. Don't worry, this is the last section of my sermon. <laughs> Should be done in another five or seven minutes. <clears throat> um, <laughs> when you look at it, there's actually quite a lot of music in our typical Sunday worship service. Now today is a healing service, so some of the what I list out won't happen today. But in our typical Sunday service, the music includes the songs for gathering, an opening hymn, the Kyrie following confession, the choir anthem, the glory of following the gospel, a hymn following the sermon, the Lord's prayer following the community prayer, music during the sharing of the peace, music during the offering, the Sanctus and non use day that we sing during the preparation of communion, the organ music and a communion hymn during the distribution of communion, a closing hymn, and a postlude from carol as most of us leave the sanctuary. Some of us hang out because we just love hearing carol play that organ. I say that she's a wonder and a great gift. I call her Saint Carol. <laughs> So that's a lot of music, and each piece of music has its symbolic, or at least its liturgical function. It guides us through the service, reinforces the message of scripture or the sermon, takes us through the journey that is communion, and gives us music to travel by as we greet one another during the peace, or bring our offerings to the front of the room, or as we exit the room. So how does the choir, a little group of people over there, how does the choir fit into all that? The choir, and that includes Carol as accompanist and me as director, the choir uses music to lift the congregation and to support Clinton and the deacons in their ministry. We do this by bringing our whole selves to the learning and performance of a piece of music week after week, all year round. The choir, you see, is part of the larger ministry team of the church, the pastor, the deacons, Breeders, the hospitality team, the tech team at the back of the room. The choir is part of the larger ministry team that prepares and delivers for the congregation what we hope and pray will be a meaningful, informative, inspirational worship experience. And music is the symbolic language through which the choir speaks. The music is just so many notes, you can ask them, and marks on a piece of paper, a lot of it in Italian. And the words we sing are just so many words organized into usually rhyming sentences. But when the choir brings their whole selves to the process, when they consider the meaning of the music, the truths to which the music points, when they connect the message of the song to their own spiritual journey, then what the choir does goes way beyond the sound they produce way beyond the harmonies and poetic words they deliver, all the way to truths that are much deeper, to statements of faith that can touch our hearts, lift our spirits, reassure our sometimes troubled souls, and even put us in the presence of the whole. 
And one of the really cool aspects of the choir's role in worship is what all of you, the listeners, bring to that few minutes of song. The choir and Carol and I don't do all this for your response, but I'll be honest, it does warm our hearts when your response lets us know that you've heard us, that you've been moved, that we've nailed a piece. We don't do it for that. It's great when that happens. But we do all this because of our love of God and our desire to contribute to a meaningful worship experience for everyone in this room or watching through the lens of that camera. I told the choir last week that I wanted to have them sing as part of the sermon this morning, but I decided to let them off the hook. You've heard them sing. You've heard them sing, We've come this far by faith. Pointing to the truth that God has never failed us yet. Amen. You've heard them sing, And I will rise. Right? Pointing to the truth of Christ's resurrection and to the promise of eternal life in Christ. You've heard them sing, usually on Palm Sunday, ain't no rock and a shout for me, about the truth of how sometimes you just have to praise God with your whole being and not leave it to the rocks and the hills to cry out for you. You've heard them sing, come just as you are, probably about 12 times. <laughs> pointing to the radical welcome that we find in God. And today you heard them saying how beautiful is the body of Christ, pointing first to the body of Jesus, the hands and the feet and the blood. Pointing then to the body of Christ found in the sacrament of communion. And then finally pointing to us as the body of Christ, called to live as Christ died, <coughs> willing to pay the price, whatever that may be. Called to tell the good news, to serve the wine and the bread to all, and to care for the children of earth. That is for everyone. So that's my understanding of the role of the choir. Like scripture, like the Eucharist, the music that the choir provides, while sometimes beautiful in its own right, <coughs> serves a bigger purpose. The music serves as symbol, pointing to truth greater than the music itself, to statements of faith that bind us as a community, and bind us indeed to God. Coming to a close now, I said that I would end with a question. <coughs> and this is my question for each of us. If symbols point to greater, deeper truths, to statements of faith, what then of our own lives? What then of our actions as individuals and as a community known as the Metropolitan Community Church of the Coachella Valley? What do we symbol? What greater truths or statements of faith do our lives and actions point to? As we greet a newcomer, as we have conversations during coffee, <coughs> as we interact with people in our daily lives away from this place, what greater truths do others see us pointing to? Consider those questions in the hours and days ahead, if you would. My prayer is that each of us though imperfect and learning as we go, that each of us will be a symbol of the Christ within us, that people will see in us the love of God, the forgiveness that we ourselves have experienced, and that they will come to know the joy of being unconditionally welcomed by God. Amen. May it be so. Amen. Amen.
6, 2017. There's this loving and almighty God in the power of the Spirit and the openness to your will. We make our prayer. Strengthen the leaders of our church here on earth, especially remembering Reverend Elder Rach Rachelle Brown, our moderator, her family, the Board of Governors, the Board of Elders, and all pastors and lay leaders who labor in the service of Christ. That those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the Inspire and guide Donald Trump, our president. Give grace, dignity, and compassion to him and to all in authority. Give humility and a spirit of service to leaders throughout the world. And raise us from our fatality. Give compassion and perseverance to us, our families, and friends our neighbors, that we may serve Christ by seeing the face of Christ in one another and seek to love as he loves, comfort and heal all of those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially remembering Linda Ray, Jan, Mark, Gary, Philome, Jim, Peter, R.D., Reverend Jim Burns, George, Rodney, Frank, and Dan. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ, especially remembering Reverend Dick and Jerry's brother Mark and Wilma. Receive into your test Receive into your rest of everlasting peace. We humbly appeal to you, O Lord. Sheep of your own fold, lambs of your own flock, children of your own redeemer. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all of your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. This we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The is our healing Sunday. It's when we take time during the service to invite anyone to come up for prayers of healing. Uh, it would be myself and my two other deacons. During this time, you, we have oil of anointing. It's for prayers for healing for yourself. You may wish to stand in for someone else who you'd like healing for, for even for prayers of thanksgiving. So during this time, you just please come forward. We have a song uh, for during this time, just as you support us in that ministry. So please come forward.
It's going to be all resurfaced and sexy looking with new lines. Um, <laughs> and I thought it was going to be right there. So please come and give out of the goodness of your hearts.
thank you so much for these gifts which have refreshed and renewed your people. Loving God, send us now out into this world in order to proclaim, proclaim your love to others. In your most precious name we pray.